when I was a kid, I was convinced that I was a total moron. <laughs> the evidence, well, it just seemed irrefutable to me. I struggled to follow instructions in school. My teachers were always irritated with me. And I was constantly being punished. And all that before the age of nine. I was really on a roll. But what frustrated me through all of it is that I really did want to do well in school, and I wanted to make my teachers proud. But somehow, I just couldn't seem to do it. What my teachers saw as order and predictability in the classroom, I experienced as unbearable rigidity. And what I saw as natural exploration and curiosity, they saw as impetuousness and rebellion. With no hope in sight, I started to internalize what my teachers were saying about me. I was a problem child. What else was I to think? I felt like a dandelion growing in a manicured garden. There was something wild about me that just couldn't quite fit in. I wanted to grow, but I knew that if I let myself blossom, the gardener would come and pluck me out. But hope was right around the corner. Everything changed for me in fourth grade. And thank you for laughing. That's me in fourth grade, <laughs> looking maybe a little nervous. But despite that nervousness, I was lucky in fourth grade. I had a teacher who was kind to me and curious about the causes of my behavior. And she nominated me for assessment with an educational psychologist. I remember being nervous when I walked into the room to meet the psychologist. Wouldn't you be? After all, I had already learned that adults at school could not necessarily be trusted. But the assessment felt different than anything I had done at school before, more like a game or a puzzle than a chore. I felt interested and engaged, and I wanted to do my best. The assessment revealed some areas where I genuinely did need to work to improve. It was true, for example, I needed some particular guidance to help me stay organized in class. But the assessment also showed a mental capability to generate new and original ideas, creativity. And that was an existing strength that I bet would have surprised my current teachers. Based on the results of that assessment, my educational psychologist recommended classroom accommodations that would help me be more myself while still learning the material in class. These accommodations were written in an official school document, referred to as an Individualized Education Plan, or IEP. From fourth grade through high school graduation, my IEP shaped educators' views of me, suggesting that they view my behaviors as indicators of high potential rather than low. And although the IEP was not a free pass to act out, it did protect me from the kinds of disheartening punishments that I had experienced in elementary school. And it set me on a course for a very different kind of achievement than my early teachers probably would have predicted. Jump forward almost 30 years, and today I'm a professor of educational psychology here at the University of Georgia, where I dedicate my professional life to helping more kids get the kinds of assessments and services that I was fortunate enough to receive. In fact, I work in the same department where an assessment I took was designed. I'm honored to do this work, and I take it really seriously, because I know the immense difference it can make in the life of a child. You can think of me as like a botanist, learning everything I can about dandelions so I can advocate for them. <laughs> On any given day, my collaborators and I might be analyzing data from hundreds or even thousands of students, searching for indicators of a creative mind. What we see in the data we have is that even now in the 2020s, the unfortunate reality is that highly creative children are substantially more likely to receive serious disciplinary action, such as out-of-school suspensions, than they are to receive appropriate instructional support from their teachers. Psychologically, creativity is defined as a mental process through which we make things that are simultaneously novel and original on the one hand and useful, 
beautiful, or communicative on the other. Like many mental attributes, creativity naturally occurs along a spectrum. And most of the time, most people fall somewhere in the middle. My work is especially focused on those kids that reliably fall on the extreme high end of the creativity spectrum. These are the kids who are strongly, almost irresistibly drawn towards novel experiences, desire autonomy in their decision making, think very flexibly, and produce surprisingly original ideas. These patterns of behavior appear to be caused, at least in part, by differences in the way the brain produces and uses a chemical called dopamine. And these differences in the dopamine system can arise in children of any age, any gender, any race. And they can also have physical or intellectual disabilities that co-occur with their creativity. But despite this diversity, highly creative kids are united by their inventiveness and imagination. Now, most educators will agree that creativity is a good thing. But in practice, the design of schools can make accommodating highly creative kids a challenge. This is because creative behaviors typically make classroom management more difficult for teachers. Like my childhood self, these kids are easily bored by predictable and repetitive tasks. And in an effort to alleviate that boredom, they could genuinely disrupt other students' learning. Their need for autonomy might cause them to completely change assignments, making them something new and original on the one hand, but also something that just doesn't match teachers' instructions. Their curiosity could lead them to question classroom content at a level that a teacher is not prepared for or used to, and so their engagement can easily be misinterpreted as contrarian or combative. And this type of misinterpretation can lead teachers to punish creative students, sometimes in a severe way that can leave them feeling resentful and distrustful towards educators. And this pathway of reactions, creative behaviors, misinterpretation, punishment, and then resentment and mistrust can create a death spiral for highly creative children's academic achievement, leading to serious under-engagement in learning that can tragically limit their future attainment and success. So in order to avoid situations like these, highly creative kids need special services and accommodations in school. In most states, these children qualify for services under the umbrella of the Gifted and Talented program, which can provide them with extra challenge or enrichment. But highly creative students could also benefit from services that are more traditionally associated with special education. For instance, a special educator might help a child develop more inhibition or impulse control and that can help them channel their creativity more effectively in the general classroom. This is why highly creative kids need specific IEPs for them. Their needs do not fit neatly into any other existing box of services that schools are already providing. And IEPs are well understood to be an effective mechanism to help teachers correctly interpret creative behaviors and avoid misunderstanding and punishment. But there's a catch. Psychologists currently rely on classroom teachers to nominate students for assessment to begin with. And because of the association between creativity and gifted education, teachers tend to nominate only those creative kids who are already academically high performing in class, and they miss those creative kids that might be struggling. And in a situation where a child has already been labeled as having a behavior problem, the more creativity they show in class, the less likely a teacher is to nominate them. What this means is that highly creative children don't tend to end up in a psychologist's office if they ever get there until after they've been on the wrong end of serious punishments. And by then, it can be too late to save their academic engagement and their trust in educators. So how can we identify these kids and implement IEPs for them in time to stop this all too common tragedy from occurring? The answer is to reverse the typical process of IEP generation with universal screening. In a universal screening process, psychologists assess every single student in a school for important mental attributes, creativity included, and then they make recommendations directly to teachers based on the results of that assessment. But you can probably guess that universal screening efforts are currently hindered by the sheer scope, size, 
and cost of that task. Right now, for every psychologist who works in an American school, on average, there's more than 1,000 students under their care. And in the state where I live, in Georgia, that number is more than twice as high, with 2,000 students to every psychologist. So it's just not feasible or possible to accomplish universal screening person to person by having a psychologist meet with every child to determine their needs. So what can we do? Well, this is where my collaborators and I come in. We have devised a system where, during normal school hours, children participate in a short, game-like task, responding to relatively simple prompts through writing, through drawing, or if they're physically unable to write or draw, through speaking. Then all of those responses from all the children in the school are instantly and automatically analyzed by a specially trained artificial intelligence model. The AI can read what children write, it can see what they draw, and it's trained to infer the psychological attributes of the children directly from those responses. The AI operates essentially as a virtual psychologist assistant. It's able to sit with every child at the same time, it never gets tired, and of course, it does not need to be paid. <laughs> Uproarious laughter, thank you. In a process called supervised machine learning, we trained our model on tens of thousands of example responses from creativity assessments drawn from participants across the world. Those responses were then systematically coded by dozens of trained psychological researchers. And that coding process was highly reliable, meaning that those humans agreed with each other consistently. The AI then learned to judge the data in the same way to the human. In fact, it agreed with the humans just as well as the humans agreed with each other. The model works well in multiple languages, for children of different ages, genders, and ethnicities, and for a variety of different psychological assessments. Right now, psych laboratories across the world are using our model for research purposes, and that's allowing us to make it better. The more data the model sees, the better it gets at identifying highly creative responses. For instance, one question that our AI-based universal screener poses to kids is what's an example of something fun? Now, this question could seem simple, but because it gives kids free reign to come up with their own ideas, it's actually quite effective at eliciting creative thinking. Kids know there's no right answer, and they're directed to respond with an idea that would surprise their classmates. But most children still give relatively straightforward responses. For instance, many kids say things like playing games, playing with my dog, going to the park. These are the fun things that kids really do and that they likely have recent memories of doing. These are the types of responses that are to be expected for a typically developing child. But some kids respond in a different way. They spontaneously verbalize something they've never done, never seen done, or that no human ever has done at all. <laughs> Thank you. In short, they think imaginatively and creatively. For example, one nine-year-old boy responded, it would be fun to walk upside down on the ceiling while wearing a hat made of cookie dough. <laughs> well, first of all, <laughs> I think that really does sound fun. <laughs> and what's more, it involves a creatively invented scenario that as far as we know, this child has never witnessed and no adult has ever described to them. <laughs> Unfortunately, however, my collaborators and I were not surprised to learn that that child had previously experienced serious punishments in school and was permanently flagged by his school system as behaviorally at risk, a label that could negatively influence the way future educators interpret his behavior. Now, I think that example illustrates the urgent need for universal screening. We need to help teachers who are already so overworked understand the psychological needs of their students. But schools tend to change their practices slowly and only when they receive some pressure from their community. So speak up. If you're a parent 
a teacher, or even a student, you deserve to advocate for universal screening in your school. Now, my collaborators and I have created a system that could have saved my childhood self from years of feeling like a dandelion. Because the thing about dandelions is they have so much to offer the world around them. They can grow anywhere, in sidewalk cracks, in barren fields, and yes, in your garden. Their roots break up hard soil, allowing other plants to eventually take hold too. Their flowers support pollinators, and their leaves have nutritious and medicinal properties that can help keep us healthy. So now more than ever, we need to allow these dandelions some space in our garden. Thanks. <laughs>